Don't eat too many bites. I know, I'm done. I'll get a stomach ache. What a motley looking crew. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. No. Yeah. Look, look, behind, with you. look behind look you. Look behind you. Jeez. Yeah, oh, the we're entire not. scene. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome to our second day of our 2022 strategic planning retreat. Um, no opening remarks today, so we'll just, Stephanie, do you want to introduce John or John, are you ready to start? Where's John? Hello. Oh, he's up there. Yeah, go ahead, John. Oh, go ahead, John. Yeah, I just want to just quickly just um, remind I know a number of people are actually watching this via live stream. So as she said, day one. Today we're gonna to have um, two presentations um, from staff to discuss their priorities. One from John Taylor, who's the planning manager, and the other one from Jim Jordan, who is um, wildlife um, conservation manager, I believe that's his title. We have on the agenda communications, but what we're gonna do is because um, Stephanie's communications manager, she guys know she's been very busy just trying to get this room set up, working along with um, Petra Reynolds, who's done a great job as well, trying to get everything prepared and ready. So we're going to do hers at a later date. So today um, it will be John and Jim. Good. And then tomorrow we'll wrap up with the other staff members. Very good. Very good. Ready to go. So I thought I'd just remind everyone sort of from planning and zoning, sort of the two priorities as far as operation wise, split in two functions, really short term day to day and then long term sort of long range planning. And so the priority really for 2022 is to really focus on long range side of these two functions. Everything in the short term uh, being zoning administration and permit review. Um, that's sort of a steady drum, um, but the long range plan as things shift on the island uh, for when you think of where we are um, now as far as Kiwa Island as a community, um, the long range planning is sort of the area that needs a little bit more focus. And so last year this time I introduced this concept of being thinking beyond the gates. So not to reinvent the wheel, just gonna continue with that theme of sort of continuing beyond the gates. Um, as we enter sort of more of a redevelopment stage, there are a lot less properties of undeveloped lands, as you all are aware. And so what attention now does the community, the town, um, where do we uh, spend that energy is looking at properties that are uh, outside of the gates as we know that there's increased pressure not just uh, on our boundaries of town limits but also along Betsy Carrison Parkway and so that's the question that uh, planning uh, myself have asked is what role does the town and the Kiwa community play in how unincorporated Johns Island develops and I'll walk through a few of those examples we've already uh, talked about annexation that's one of them uh, you know how much involved uh, myself Mr. Prickett uh, I've been involved in the roads and the transportation network and so those are the things that get us to focus a little bit beyond the gates. It's not ignoring what's um, behind the gates, it's just that there's a priority now for a lot more pressures outside of the gates. The second sort of overarching theme is adaptive management planning. This is sort of a, a, a continuation as well. Flood mitigation, sea level rise is still a concern. And so we must continue to just look at resiliency. Um, and you'll see based on the major goals, how that plays in. Uh, number one, really starting with the comprehensive plan. That's our bread and butter, and so we'll do that this year. Uh, the Planning Commission is excited already and ready to get that going. Um, I'll walk through a little bit of how that ties in overall. Um, the, the remaining of these kind of all fall into that long-range planning uh, atmosphere or, or bucket. Um, the Regional Transportation Network, what I'm going to do first is walk you through uh, one of the priorities of the main road corridor, that project. And so we've been doing, when I say we, I, I feel like we're, 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 we're a team now. <laughs> we're constantly <laughs> around with Prickett um, in our efforts to ensure that Kiwa has a voice, Kiwa has representation on, on how Johns Island roads um, happen and how they develop. And so I'll walk through that proposal and our conversations that we've had with several community members, stakeholders in the area. 
And then annexation and growth management. Uh, we started that conversation already on annexation. Uh, that will continue, and I'll introduce a concept of thinking about how can we think about growth management. That was a concern that came out of the end of West proposal. But one of those things is looking at um, the town is not necessarily aggressively. When you look at some communities, some communities aggressively go to annex. I don't think that that's our position of aggressively wanting to annex uh, areas, but we should think of strategies of how to protect our existing uh, community. And then as we expand or as properties are potentially annexed, most of those properties currently under the town's jurisdiction fall in a development agreement. And so they're subject to Key Wild and architecture review standards. <coughs> Hypothetically, if there were properties that were came into the town and they were not part of that development agreement, we would not have any design standards. We would have limited purview of how the look and feel of those new developments would, would play. So this is now a great time to introduce some development standards and design standards in our zoning ordinance that would at least gives us some opportunity to, to uh, have some look and feel for anything that's not part of the development agreement. And then finally, marsh management plan. Uh, I walked through that uh, throughout this presentation, but that's been a priority. Um, so I'll, I'll walk through this Rose proposal and one of the things that's unique is that Charleston County introduced uh, the main road corridor project, and that's from Bees Ferry all the way to Betsy Carrison. And one of the things that we as Kiowa community must think about is how do we tie into that network? So I want you to imagine this. Imagine how Sea Island roads are today and what they will look like 15 years from now. And one of those things that we must think of, it should still be efficient, but one of the key things is making sure that it still keeps that low country feel, that character under the oaks, under the canopy. And so the Sea Islands way has been a tagline now that we're gonna to try to maybe move, move with. Mr. And um, <laughs> I asked the former mayor whether he likes that title or not. He worked, he was up all night working on titles. <laughs> John, we, we needed a handle for this. You've gotta have a name for it or people don't know what you're talking about. And uh, a lot of people worked on it. And to John Taylor's credit, he came up with that idea last night. Under the Oaks? The Sea Islands Way. Oh. Yeah. Well, I know you yes. suggested my way or the highway. We're still massaging it. So the mayor wants my way or the highway. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm going to just walk through the entire concept. And then if you have questions, feel free to stop me doing this. But really, uh, just to remind you, the primary pur purpose of the Main Road Corridor project is to reduce congestion and to increase capacity through that corridor. And reminder, that starts all the way from uh, Bees Ferry Road, coming across Highway 17, all the way down Main Road to Bohicket, <coughs> eventually ending and stopping at Betsy Carrison. And then there's a secondary purpose to introduce uh, safety as pertains to bike and ped. Um, here's a corridor broken up into three segments. Uh, we'll focus on segment C right now. Uh, just to highlight, segment A is from Bees Ferry to uh, Chisholm or River Road, Main Road intersection. That's already going through the design phase. And so they're moving forward with that particular, they have a preferred alternative identified and they're moving through the design phase. Segment B, which is sort of the middle section, think Main Road, where Chisholm Road, passing the high school, all of that area. Um, that project is inactive. The county has shared that they believe with the future 526 that this segment will not be needed. Improvements. Um, say, be, say that one, say that one more they time. They believe that segment B, which is this segment between uh, sort of Chisholm Road coming okay. south to uh, Brownswood Road, that this segment would not necessarily need to be improved because of the 526 traffic would oh. shift in that direction and so this segment as it is today would not necessarily be needed they do believe that segment c which is the final segment uh is is still necessary and this is what most people experience as sort of the the character and feel of bohicket road driving down the southern johns island and so right now the county is working towards a preferred alternative and we're in the process of identifying what that may look like um, I'm going to show just a few of these level of service map. I won't go too much into detail because this can get really dry. But what I'll do is show this is a level of service map that search that that explains today's conditions. Uh, today's conditions, you can see the purpose of this project, the main road corridor, um, which is in this red to yellow to red color in the center here. 
it's red. Red represents sort of the worst conditions uh, based on capacity. And so that's the purpose and why the county is saying, hey, we need to do something. Uh, we fast forward in time, 10 years to 2030. This is now saying that 526 is built. So if you notice, a lot of main road has improved. And so that was part of the reason that the county says, hey, because 526 is not in place, and let me help orient you. Here's West Ashley and 526. If you turn right, you kind of see where my cursor there is coming across John's Island. And that is, that would be 526. So that new area now, those who are traveling to Southern John's Island would no longer come up to the main and 17 intersection, but they would stay on 526, um, come across West Ashley, come across John's Island and, and drop off at Maybank Highway on the other side. And so with that, we see a pattern shift in, in, in traffic with less traffic on the main road corridor, but now this intersection of Maybank Highway and River Road becomes a little bit more strained. Um, and so the proposal that I'm gonna share in a few moments, so it's gonna look at that particular pattern shift of traffic really no longer being a, an issue on Main, main Road um, and Bohicket, but really looking at how uh, traffic needs to get to um, Maybank Highway and 526. Um, so this is even further along 2040. Uh, level service map and you can even see River Road becomes this intersection now that many of you travel Main Road and, and River Road um, City County has ever been been doing so many improvements in that intersection mm -hmm. and There's a little bit of progress here a little bit of progress there, but Comprehensively when you look at the road network, it just doesn't work based on these uh, projections um, So what I want you to notice is that Primarily, if, if, for example, most people who leave Southern Johns Island, if they're going into the city of Charleston, most of them will go up Bohicke Road and either find the closest route to get back over to Maybank Highway. Some may go all the way up to the intersection. Some may cut down plow ground. A lot of people use Berry Hill um, Road to get over. But that's the idea because most of that traffic wants to get to the city. And we want to play into that concept of how do we support that idea of getting traffic to that uh, area of Johns Island. So rewind a little bit. Here is the five alternatives that Charleston County put out over a year ago. I think a year and maybe 15 months or so now. Um, and this was their proposal to segment C. And all of these are a combination of either road widenings or new roads. The first being widening Bohicket Road from an existing two lane cross section to either a four or five lane cross section. The same would be for River Road on the south end here in blue, from a two lane current uh, section to either a four or five lane uh, cross section. Uh, those of you who have been following Kiowa for a long time, you might have remembered the Sea Island Greenway, Cross Island Parkway. Um, that concept, which was a new road that cut across the middle of John's Island, that's in this sort of purple color here. That closely mirrors that alignment of taking a new road at the intersection of Betsy Carrison across the middle of John's Island and then tying back into somewhere along River Road to Maybank Highway intersection. Um, the other two alternatives that you see are combinations, so either a combination of uh, widening Bohicke Road um, and taking a new road over or widening Bohicke Road and taking a plow ground over. Um, this is what the county placed out to the community to have feedback. One of the things that came back was majority of everyone agreed that they would not want to see Bohicke Road destroyed as far as tree canopies and that experience. Um, so that's another concept that we want to play into. So those things that I, I'll keep reminding you, the idea to get traffic back to Baybank, the idea to protect the integrity of Bohicke Road, those are all things that will play into the Sea Islands Way concept uh, that's moving forward. So here we are in this proposal. We believe that uh, I, uh, Edenville Road, south of Edenville Road, doesn't necessarily need to be improved. If we look at the traffic data, um, south of Edenville Road really doesn't need to be improved. So the first priority really would be widening Bohicke Road going north from Edenvale all the way up to Brownswood Road. 
The second would be an idea to cut across. Uh, and that, right now, this is showing using plow ground road. Plow ground road is an existing road, so adding a, a couple lanes to that would be cost efficient compared to creating a new road. And this now creates an alternative to Maybank Highway, a parallel to Maybank Highway. So hypothetically, going back to my scenario, is if you do uh, take uh, Bohicke Road up to Maybank, a lot more development has happened on Maybank and a lot more will be happening. Commercial development will be happening on Maybank. And so there are no plans to either <coughs> widen uh, or expand Maybank Highway. But now uh, this creates an opportunity to have a parallel. So traffic that is not necessarily has a destination to actually Maybank Highway and they just want to get to the city or to 526, they can actually use Plow Ground Road as an alternative. Now, as, as a planner, I leave the engineering up to the engineers. And so none of the ideas of how you get across matters to me. So this is just showing an alternative. If it's not plowed ground, could it be a new access road coming across? Um, but the, I, the, the, the end goal is to still get us to 526 and to Maybank Highway. Um, the final piece that I'll share is that if you see this segment here, there's a lot of red lines here, but this segment that, let me go back here because I think this best shows it. Um, the, the new road here that shows cutting across, turning north, this segment creates a parallel to River Road. One of the concerns in many, in a, many of our meetings with Charleston County staff is that they believe River Road widening that would not be an option. You destroy too many trees, there are a lot of homes and businesses too close to the road, and that would result in a lot of takings and a lot of financial uh, uh, impact. So they believe uh, sort of a parallel to River Road at this intersection where Plow Ground is, is the best solution. It creates a new road, this is undeveloped land, and uh, it takes the same path to get us where we need to go. And so that's why you see this uh, alternative here. But the idea is not to necessarily have um, uh, one route or the other. It's just for, for the concept of the Sea Island Ways, is to get us to the destination of Maybank Highway in 526. Um, whether that happens via plow ground road or a new road, it's still that direction and getting up that way. And John, in your, in your comments, they are county staff? Yeah, county staff. We've, we've met with county <coughs> staff several times, um, and that is the direction that they're leaning. They actually like this idea because of that, that uh, notion that disturbing River Road and so many homes, so many trees so close to the road will be problematic. John, did I understand you to just say uh, that the county is leaning towards the purple line? No, no sir. So the purple line okay. is just one of the alternatives. Right now, if I were to take a, a, a educated uh, guest on where the county stands, they actually like the widening Bohicket Road, um, but they know it's problematic because of the trees. Um, what they mostly fear is disturbing so many communities that are close to the road. And so any of the alternatives that show disturbances that are really close to the road, I think they will be hesitant to move forward with that approach. So with that line of reasoning then, doesn't the purple purple route make the most sense because you could build it without disturbing anything and uh, you're not tearing up the road traffic while you're building and widening if you and you're not really Mary, disturbing tree canopies? If you ask Mayor Charlie that, he would tell you the same thing, that that was his uh, idea that that would be the less disruptive road, creating a new road. I think okay. it just does not have the political winds that's necessary for that to happen. Uh, one of the things that has to happen also is going through the Army Corps of Engineer, and it's been shared with us that that is unlikely that the permitting process would move forward with that much uh, right away that it uh, goes over wetlands or just, ju it just really doesn't have the political backing for that to happen. And so that's the purpose okay. of really thinking about turning. Okay. John, this new road um, south, south of plow ground, parallel plow ground, why there? Is there a sense from county staff? Is there, is there, I mean, as you can see, that's vacant property. But I mean, is it because of that? It's, it's a couple things. It's politics. 
uh, to be honest. And there there's some big land tracks that are right. some some big influences. And so I think that's part of the conversation of going across some of these larger tracks that have some big political weight could be disturbing. To have it there or not to have it to, there? To have to it not, there. There's political winds not to, to not To not have it there, yeah. To not, to not to have it there. So it gets us back to plow ground. Yeah, so yeah. we believe, I, I think plow ground is the best option. And I think our conversation with county staff that actually kind of support that idea is just engineering it now into a way, and I, I should give that update. Um, they're currently modeling this example so see if the actual metrics will will meet the, the needs of uh, traffic efficiency. So although this is real schematic, they're actually running the, the model to kind of see if it really fit, pans out. Um, yeah. So the plow ground uh, option here goes all the way to River Road. It's not a hybrid that goes just to the road that parallels River Road. So the plow ground road in the proposal that we're thinking about will stop and go parallel to River Road. So to make that turn. To make that turn gotcha. to avoid okay. River Road. I'm just showing it because ideally, um, whatever best is engineered would be the route. I got you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And the, where the blue road on River terminates and it turns to red, what's that distance on the red going up River Road? Got to be like a couple of miles? Yeah, I think a few miles, two and a half, three miles. One thing to also remember is if 526 is built, it's likely to, because of the bridges involved and the right-of-ways and so on, you, you may be talking as much as 10 years before we actually see that. Mm -hmm. So connecting to what looks like an airport terminal over there, the little yellow thing on your map, that's 526's connection south of Maybank Highway. There's one north of Maybank Highway as well. But we have to survive between now and 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. So having this plow ground or its reasonable alternative cross there and improvements made to get up to Maybank Highway is terribly important during this next decade. Because even if the connection to 526 isn't yet there, you're ready for it and you get traffic improvements between now and then. Say what you just said again, Dan. The yellow, what is it? The yellow is the connection to, five, that's the 526 yes. connection. So the thicker part of the yellow is really the expressway coming down and then when it gets thinned out, yeah. that's, um, just, that's just the exit ramp getting it from yeah. the, the the highway, yeah. okay. It just doesn't. The yellow, if you put in 526, would be a much longer yellow line if you put the whole thing in. That's just the connection to it. And remember, there's one about equidistant north of Maybank okay. Highway that will connect up there as okay. well. Yeah. So you've got to get the plow ground, let's call it corridor, has to connect us to 526, which is the yellow interchange there. And it's got to get us up to Maybank Highway to get to 700 safely. John, I have a quick question. Based on the proposal in red, for segment C, would they, in addition to our proposal, would they also still consider four and five to go all the way to River Road? So that's one of the things that, as part of the proposal that we've came up with um, in the conversation where south of Edenvale wouldn't necessarily be improved. So, no. no. If I go back to the level of service, this is that 2040. Here's south of Edenvale. Mm -hmm. I mean, C's not great, but it's mm -hmm. not as far as a uh, plot ground or a river road. John, this is kind of off the track of the discussion, but all of these other red lines, you know, as you get into the peninsula and things like that, that just isn't a, a color. That really represents... That's a traffic condition. There's traffic conditions. So yeah. 700 is that bad and... Right, 700, if yeah. you look to the right, the legend, if you, is that on your map? But that's, yeah. your, that's your 2040, that's not current condition. Yeah, this, right. is, this is projection 2040. to 2040. I will say this, I mean, 
levels of service is really difficult to show actual numbers and metrics, but so it's looking at more of a holistic segment. Um, so taking in the intersection improvements that may occur, that may make some impact to whether those turn from red to orange or, or whatnot. Um, but this is looking at 2040 based on, and this includes the chats data, um, the, the COGS data that uh, takes into future developments and future uh, growth. Because it would seem that with the 526 expansion, it would have a significant impact on those roads also. Yeah, the unique, I think the question that's not honestly being addressed is the Maybank Highway going towards the city, which is already pretty strained. Um, but I think 526 could alleviate some of that. We just don't know based on the route that somewhere may take going into the city or going to the north area. You see, uh, Maybank Highway, uh, as you cross the river, continues to become much, you know, it's four lanes after you cross the river, right. but it's a serious problem. Yes, it is. And there's not a lot of easy solutions there. No. Uh, so even for our residents, if you were going in 700 to get to the city, it's going to be tough. Mm -hmm. But even with this plan here for 2040, they're showing with the Mark Clark extension in it. That's it, yeah. That's the green line. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you can see it uh, on the other side of uh, River Road there, that circular green line is 526. So it's not a perfect world, but uh, anyway, they're engineering this and, and looking at it, you know, literally acre by acre in terms of what's yeah. possible. and. Hopefully we'll hear back from them shortly of what they think. So if, if we think about next steps, um, the next steps really being um, the, the engineering and sort of the, the data sets and the, the metrics, I think that has come to a level or, or a point where it's um, uh, moving pretty slow because it's, it's, it's kind of where it will be. Uh, the next really point is really gaining the political and the community support behind this 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 uh, proposal. So currently, right now, I'm in the process of setting up meetings with with the community. We've met with several other uh, Johns Island residents to really get them on board, or really to give them an idea of what this concept uh, feels and looks like. And that'll be important to uh, the county because what we don't want to happen is becomes. Uh, this is only supported by Kiowa residents. <laughs> so um, the important piece for down is to really get uh, John Island support behind, which I think we are able to do that because of uh, some of the um, some of the things that include not touching the canopy south of Edenvale, avoiding uh, a lot of communities that are really tight and close to the road using the existing uh, rights away, that kind of thing. So that's kind of where this particular project is. We anticipate two things uh, that I'll add to this. Hopefully we'll be able to have an update on those metrics before next month. Um, and we're pushing the county to, to at least let us know where they are in that assessment. And then finally, what I did not share as far as the big concept of regional roads, we will have, or is projected to be announced that we will have a new estimate on the cost for 526 in 2022. So that will have some implications really in the discussions from council okay, members of county council has been, of course, as many communities tapping into federal dollars um, to get that support or get those projects um, completed. Have our colleagues at uh, Seabrook bought into Sea Island Way? We have had a few meetings with Seabrook. They support the majority of this. We have not uh, had like an official meeting um, that will share, but they've been in our, our work, our working group, and they support um, the general concept of uh, having a direct route that gets anyone on the southern end of Jolly Jolly, which would include Seabrook to Maybank Highway. Um, so they do support that. So when is all this likely to happen? Is time this frame. A five year or ten year. Or, you know? So the county broke this project into those three phases to move it a little bit forward faster. Uh, the first segment I think is 2024 for completion. For okay. completion. Then this segment, uh, if we're able to get 
for a preferred alternative by the end of the year, I think it's 2025, 26, if I'm not mistaken. But the reason they broke it up into those segments because it's easier to get through the permitting process to go through the NEPA process. Um, and so that takes some months and years off of the, if we try to do this whole segment into one, one as one project. So this is just ballpark, potentially this is five years away. I would say four, four to five years, and, and the other one would be two. 526? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I can say I mean, construction probably be a seven year project maybe, I think. I don't, I, it's hard to put a timetable just because permitting costs because of time frame now. Let's just say 20, 30, 32 or something. So, so, so both of them are long range, but this would, this would be more, this would be sooner, sooner than 526, yes. And that's to Councilman Perkins' point, we need some relief today and this will provide some of that relief today. Uh, John, Alt 6 is the fix. What is that? So if I go back to this slide that shows these five alternatives, right. there's a local group, Rational Roads, <coughs> they produced uh, an alternative to these five options. That alternative, uh, Alt 6, um, introduces a concept of um, significantly not making any widenings to any of the roads, but looking really at intersection improvements and turn lanes to larger developments. So it's really like a fragmentation of a lot of smaller pieces for the, the, uh, the corridor. It really does not focus on segment C. Most of the improvements or suggestions that's out of the Alt 6 focuses on um, segment B, which is mm -hmm. between our, what I would call downtown Johns Island, Maine, and Maybank, um, going north towards Chisholm Road, which there are some really good suggestions mm -hmm. in that proposal, but it just does not provide, in my opinion, the traffic relief from a congestion standpoint that addresses the project need from the county, which is reducing uh, congestion, increasing capacity. But there are a few things in there I think that are would benefit um, Johns Island specifically if you think about the intersection of Chisholm Road and Main Road by the high school, oh, yeah. if you ever drove out of that trying to make a left or right, you're peeking around two trees. And so that's one thing that the county could have made that intersection improvement absent of this particular project. That And they've, they've agreed to do that at, at uh, Marianne Point Road already. Right. So it's one of those things of pushing uh, those particular intersection projects to get done, not absent of studying a full corridor, which I think can happen. Okay, thank you. John, you mentioned that staff is, they're engineering the seaway, the sea islands way. Are they engineering alternative six? They are. Yeah. And I mean, we really, I think the, the, the advice received from council members is they county council members is they don't want to do a battle between either or so I think at the end of the day it'll be something where it's fragmented and I think gaining support either direction I think is where transparently we'll have to do in the, in the, in the long run but I think um, this particular concept addresses the project need which is the most benefit I think to county council and county staff is addressing that that project need of reducing congestion and increasing capacity because they don't want to stay away from this is I didn't mention that but this is tied to the referendum for the half cent uh -huh. sales tax um, hmm. and so they don't want to divert from that okay one big difference I might mention uh, the 526 uh, because they haven't repriced it in recent years uh, there is a real issue around where is the funding going to come from now in this environment where the federal government may have extra money to send down to the states there's a better chance it could get done which is good this project segment c is is funded right. the half cent sales tax funds this 100 percent right. so there's no funding issue it's really an engineering yeah. and a political issue now not a funding issue which you is have helpful to, keep, to us you have to 
keep track of that funding and make sure nobody else uses it. Right. <laughs> okay, good. Thanks, John. Nice job, John. Well, thank you. I will move forward to just the other two sort of priorities for planning. I'm sorry, John. Okay. Could you um, just take a moment and describe to everybody the um, framework of support that you've been building, the, the different groups that you've been meeting with. I think they'd find that interesting, that this is not just us, us local boys and girls that are doing this. This is really something that, you know, the community in a large framework is oh, looking okay. at. I've got, okay. let me mention some things, and John, please add on. We have met with the chair of the county council, Teddy Pryor. We met with Anna Johnson, who is the council person that represents Johns Island. Uh, and we met with Jenny Honeycutt, who's our council person, uh, and outlined f for them these kind of plans and, and are getting their feedback. Uh, further, as John alluded to, we have talked to the project engineers and the project staff who are doing the engineering aspect of all of this. And, and they very professional staff at the county level, and they've been very receptive. Um, We've also met with representatives from the Johns Island Community Association. Um, we've met with uh, Kiowa River, that development, and their owners and developers. And we've met with Kiowa Island Estates, Kiowa River Estates, and their homeowners association, and shared all of this information with them to get their support. And we'll follow back up with okay. them because as we have public hearings and need for public input, we need. Our residents, mm -hmm. Seabrook residents, and Johns Island residents Together. all to step forward. Uh, we have a meeting coming up with the board members from Charleston Collegiate. Uh, that school, as all of you know, is on plow ground. Mm -hmm. So the impact on that school of this kind of traffic congestion on plow ground becomes important, and we'd like to gain their support uh, for these kinds of changes. Um, so we're doing all that now, and we have additional meetings set up actually in this next week. We have two more meetings coming up to further Great. try to explain our situation. And I think John's got it down to the point now where you can kind of explain this, um, but we're also trying not to tie the county down to how you get over to the intersection. Plow ground's a good option, we think, because it's an existing roadbed. It's a lot easier and cheaper to expand that than it is to build a new road. But if the preference is a new road, that's fine. There are also several alternatives as to how to get up River Road. Um, and we don't want to tie their hands because they can get down to lot lines and, <laughs> and, you know, easements that we can't look at at our level that they can look at. So we're allowing them to help us uh, define this, but that's where we are. And there's, we've been, uh, in answer to your question, John, uh, Mr. Mayor, warmly received by these groups. Right. They're anxious to learn about this and anxious to know that there could be solutions ahead as opposed to just, we're not doing anything, you know, so. You know, another group, Dan, just thinking of it, I was out that way, you know, beside Charleston Collegiate, Seacoast, the big, a church. Big church. C -church. Right. If that's one of their mega churches, they'd have some interest because yes. Yes. those are typically pretty big facilities. Yeah. Okay, great. Well done, Daniel and John. A lot of new friends. Okay. So just continuing on sort of the goals that addresses sort of the regional transportation network and us continuing to strengthen our planning and, and uh, planning relationships with the Johns Island community, county staff, et cetera. Uh, we've dived into annexation and growth management a little bit uh, at our first workshop. I won't go too much into like the details because we will be meeting on February 8th to kind of go through uh, sort of some specifics. But I do want to just share just a couple of things around just concepts that I'll likely introduce. Um, when we think about annexation and growth management, um, one of the things that um, is important to think about is how do we do that? Um, like I stated before, I don't think the position of the town is to really aggressively go and try to annex 
the entire southern end of Johns Island. Um, but I think there ought to be some strategy to think about what types of properties would be uh, likely compatible with the Kiowa community. And so one of those things, number first thing that is already underway, we're, we've taken a study of the Kiowa Island Parkway, um, that corridor which is from the gate uh, to the circle, traffic circle, that also uh, have, includes segments along Seabrook Island Road and Betsy Carrison. That particular project um, is to assess whether or not we should think about any future infrastructure improvements that would marry into any future development in the area. The Kew Island Parkway is the town's primary uh, road in and out of the community. And so from an infrastructure standpoint, that's important and how much capacity is there. But further along, any development that happens on that would change the character and look and feel of your approach to Kiowa. And so one of the things that, as a result of that uh, corridor study, hopefully we'll be able to, and Kimley Horn is a consultant that's working through that. We anticipated having some preliminary uh, uh, concepts for you at this retreat, but that's been delayed. We'll hopefully have something next month, um, some of the preliminary assessments to share with, with council. Um, but one of the things that, as a result of that study, additionally, I'll prepare is hopefully a overlay district along the parkway, uh, which will introduce maybe some buffers along the parkway, so that at least we are captured that and protecting that. But additionally, really looking at uh, if there's development along the parkway or along uh, Seabrook Island, uh, I'm sorry, Bessie Carrison, all of these new developments that include Sea Island, I'm sorry, not Sea Island, the, um, senior living facility, MUSC, these all will add um, some pressures. And so when we collectively look at all the future development in the area, um, do we need to make any improvements? Do we need to prepare to, to at least ask for the county to assist us with that or ask for the developer to assist with some of these infrastructure improvements as, as they come in, um, absent if they're in the county or not, or in the town or not? The other part of that is conservation. So there's been a lot of comments, well, can't we just put all of this area that's raw land, 500 acres, and not build anything? That's highly unlikely. But I think that there are some critical areas, some critical uh, sensitive um, areas that probably could be protected or conserved around uh, this particular area outside beyond the gates. And so maybe putting an approach, we've, uh, I've had some preliminary conversations with the Conservancy and what they're thinking about and they're already doing a project, they're working with the Johns Island Task Force for Betsy Carrison Corridor Protection um, for that right away. When you drive Betsy Carrison Corridor, most people do not want it to become a folly road uh, where you see commercial development on the frontage. And so can we in include easements or buffers to protect that? And so that's something that will probably be likely still on the agenda uh, for the Johns Island Task Force and the uh, Conservancy to, to create this conservation corridor as you approach uh, Kiel One Seabrook. John, just to, to note a, a question on that slide and just to note, uh, the, to note, um, getting back to the previous discussion that we had earlier, in the solid yellow that's just adjacent to the municipal center, for anybody that's listening, uh, four of those properties have just been sold within the past year. Right. That's just a point of reference. Um, and from Everything that's solid yellow that's called Cacique, um, I think I read that six of their properties have now been turned or transitioned to as part of the conservancy. So that I don't know where the six properties lie, yeah. but but that, and from that solid solid yellow all the way down to the gate, there's nothing that's buildable, correct? On the either side, either that's side. either been part. Of, that's either that's been part of the part of the um, swap that went to the conservancy. Okay, that, that, yes. Yeah. yeah okay. So we're really, again, as I pointed out on earlier this week on Tuesday, that, uh, uh, what do you call it, not shaded, but... Uh, the hatched. Hatched. <laughs> the hatched yellow. I think that was the awareness that we went through in the fall. That I, I don't know that newer members to the com you know, community at large realized that there was that much land, over 500 acres, 2,000 home sites, et cetera. It's a big, big piece of property. Yeah. On both sides of the street. On both sides of the street, correct. 
Right. What is Hall Over Creek development? So Hall Over Creek is uh, the arm of the Goodwin family. That so that particular the Goodwin family. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And then you can see um, that little bit of white space on the other side of Seabrook that we are building the um, ER, and then across the street that's all the new. This is the living. Right. So there's still some remaining of fresh fields that could be built out, correct? Correct. There's very minimal, but uh, there is a, a small slit of, of fresh fields that could be built. Um, they've, they've reached pretty close to their um, entitlements as far as units uh, with the senior living. There were some reductions at the end, so that uh, they do have some entitlements remaining, but it's not as many as I thought there expect. was one building. As far as building wise? I, yeah, I thought there was, you know, in that kind of the. This area right in over back this area. Uh, on the other side. There. Adjacent yeah. to Andalin? Uh, yeah. I, I thought there was room for one building, but I could be, the, I could be mistaken. Across the, the lagoon, that, that area, yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. For what? For what? I don't know, but I think it was. But I, I can. I, I have to get those numbers. Uh, I have been working on that, but I'll get those numbers of exactly. Yeah, that would be helpful. Um, so the other part of this annexation conversation. Um, this is this sort of goes back to our conversation earlier this week, but these are the things that that I am. Oh, sorry. I thought I heard that part. Um, the, these are the things that went back earlier this week um, that we've kind of heard from the community in the fall um, regarding the, the Andel West. And so a lot of these things, like I said, we'll discuss on the 8th and looking at uh, which was mentioned, we looked at several communities and we feel that there are a couple that we can pull from that really will help out as far as the, uh, number one, the sort of insateness of that an annexation petition and zoning can happen be established sort of in a syn synchron synchronized time, the increased opportunity for public engagement and ensuring that still the developer has a reasonable time to, to see their project or uh, request through. Um, the other part of that is really considering strategies um, for annexation. Uh, the town actually did a few of these uh, brief, quick uh, fiscal impact analysis to kind of look at what potential costs would burden the town if properties were annexed. Uh, I, wrote, I worked with the road to kind of get some numbers generally on whether that be uh, provision of solid waste services, um, uh, protection, uh, police protection, additional needs, that type of thing. And so we are able to at least get a preliminary glance at what the financial impact, but that would be something as from a strategy standpoint that council can consider as part of the evaluation of whether or not uh, an area could be uh, annexed. The other part of that, prop, the other piece of that, um, where a lot of communities actually do, they list priorities as far as a list of types of properties. We don't really have that issue, but I'll give you an example of what that kind of looks at. I mentioned earlier that there are municipalities that do uh, annex pretty frequently. Particularly those are like donut holes. When we think of Johns Island where you can have two properties in the city, property in the county, property county. Um, the city would most likely for efficiency and it helps with public service as far as uh, solid waste. So if you have whoever your garbage collector is, they have to skip two properties because now you have two different providers. Um, so info areas, a lot of people or a lot of communities take that as the, the first priority. When you think about um, Kiowa, I mean, we have sort of Kiowa proper what I would identify is sort of from the gate um, back to the east, and then you have Freshfields area. Um, we don't really have donut holes. If you want to count Cacique as a donut hole, man, <laughs> it's not really a donut hole, but that would be the type, type of things that uh, other communities uh, look at. And then others would be similar uh, public service that are used. So when we think about um, properties that share the same utility companies. So if based on the Andel track being provided by Seabrook Island Sewer, 
we know, I mean, Super Valley Utilities, we know that they have a certain extent of where they will provide services. And so when you think about Johns Island, uh, Johns Island Water Company, they have identified a furthest extent of where they will not extend those lines. And so a lot of times communities use those lines as sort of a boundary of where we will sort of draw a line of how far, far we annex. Um, I've also, I've mentioned conservation. That could be a, a type of uh, cri criteria. And then the other one is align properties that are compatible. Um, so whether or not they are already built, that was the case with Fresh Fields. Fresh Fields was already sort of fits the build of the look and feel of what Kiwa is. And so that property was annexed into the town because of that. So there's a list that I'll put together to share with you and we'll talk a little bit further in detail what that could be. But I think it's important for council to at least have some things that they can just chew on as they're making evaluations to whether or not a property should or shouldn't be annexed. John, if you know, um, when Mark Pramar made his presentation on uh, Tuesday, he had a um, historical perspective, going back to the Kuwaiti or the Royals or Kuwaitis, et cetera. That hatched piece of property that, you know, the, resort, the good ones effect, eventually purchased what would have been the zoning, or would there have been a zoning? What would the zoning have been when the Kuwaitis owned it, or when the you know, or I think when it's not incorporated? Most of that area was tomato field, so I would think some some level of ag, AGR, way back when. Way back when. So when would it have converted from the tomato fields to? <laughs> Is it when he bought it that they changed the zoning to? I don't know that today, but I can get that answer. For I think it'd just be interesting again from a historical perspective. Was it part of the deal when he acquired those? Or five? it could have been when the county did a comprehensive yeah, update in their comprehensive plan. They could have just could have changed it to residential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It could have just been initiated by county staff at the time, not necessarily the owner. And but the John's town look at that. Yeah. And there may not have been a town at that time necessarily to oppose it, like we did. What two years ago? Oh, right, back then, back in the seventies or eighties, it wasn't obviously it as wasn't populated, so it really right. wasn't. And the enabling. It may have been even pre, so. pre. I'm guessing pre, incorporation of the town. Of the Kiwa. town. Yeah, I remember this old map when I was at county. It was literally like sheets of paper folded on top of the other. You unfolded it to see what the <laughs> previous zoning was before the enabling act came in. So yeah. that's one of those things mm -hmm. I remember. I mean, it's all um, with the value. It's just kind of an interesting perspective. And that, that was typical of most farms at the time when it was, when it changed hands as part of this, or, or with the comprehensive review, well, they, they moved, been, yeah. defaulted it, to an R4. It could have been just like John said, when the South Carolina State Enabling Planning Act was adopted in 1994 that required municipalities, I believe, to, to invoke zoning, comprehensive plans. The county may have, I don't, you know, don't quote me on this, but that may have been the trigger. So to answer your question, it could be that during that time, a lot of municipalities or counties went through a whole planning process and they could have, through their comprehensive plan, master plan, they could have made the change um, at that time. It had been for, all, for a lot of different areas, not just this particular area, but it could have been, you know, in other parts of the county that was in the unincorporated area. Or it could be that down the road, that whoever bought the property could initiate. So that'll be interesting to see you how that see how when that changed, how did it occur? And is Who is the typical default to an R four? R well R one. It could be an R one or R two. But this um, property is R four. Yeah, but I wouldn't say typical. Normally, I think typical is just some sort of single family use is normally yeah. the typical. Um, baseline and whatever that could be different codes it could be an r1 which is one unit per acre or r2 and this could be you know r4 or so and to your other point i think that I mean that still happens today so for for example the county has they will still look at their different planning areas across the entire county and look at uh development patterns and say well when they go through the comprehensive review plan review does this area, do we need to change the future land use category for this? And so that could have been a, a time where they say, well, this might likely be more developed, this might be more dense. So let's go ahead and make this uh, a R4 area. Mm -hmm. um, the final component to sort of this annexation, and this is something that um, I've had several conversations with, with 
many staff members, but a lot of community members. Um, really, we've been doing a good job, I think, of putting out publications of what zoning is, what mm -hmm. development agreements are. I think we just have to continue to educate the community on the different planning processes and how they impact. Um, I think a lot of people still are unaware that you can have a, an area that's been forested for 30 years and trees come down and they didn't know that that could have been developed. And so right. it's just continuing that education process. And I think introducing annexation, that will be a continual thing that we'll need to do. Yeah, I think that's critical. People understand the history, you know, the, the different publications of the history of Kiowa, but now we're getting into a more tactical, you know, rather than just a historical perspective in terms of what it what it really means. And I, um, the second phase of that is development and design standards. I briefly mentioned, hypothetically, if we would have had properties that are not tied to the development agreement today come into the town's jurisdiction we wouldn't have that same level of purview of look and feel. So the architectural review board wouldn't be able to say, hey, this is a color that you can use on the palette or those other really um, aesthetic design features. We don't have that built into the zoning ordinance. Um, I mentioned this to our planning commission. They think that um, having at least starting with a tree and landscape ordinance and the sign ordinance is important. Mm -hmm. uh, that will at least give us some some protections around vegetation and that kind of thing. Sign ordinances just based on commercial development. I've introduced already the, the Key Island Parkway overlay that would introduce a buffer. But really um, having some level of protections uh, for properties outside of the scope of that development agreement will be critical. Um, if a plan, hypothetical if a plan development comes, we can build that into the plan development. But if someone just wanted to have a standard single R1 zoning district uh, come into the town, they would just be subject to the standard R1 zoning requirements, but we wouldn't necessarily have that R ARB sort of really stringent uh, uh, design standards as Kiowa community is accustomed to. Um, so introducing this through the Planning Commission and then making a recommendation from, from them to council to you all um, will be sort of something that we look at this year. John, I have a question. Um, you know, there's, there's been discussion in terms of ARB and what happens to the ARB, where do they go, et cetera. Um, if for some reason, you know, at, at some point, if for some reason they're absorbed by Kika, what impact will that have on Freshfields that currently is that, will the Freshfields ARB still be in play? Also, as you and the Planning Commission are discussing, you know, the 500 potential acres, if is developed and stays developed in the town, um, there's nothing, there wouldn't be an ARB review, correct, not unless I'm not sure what, and I don't know this, I'm not sure if it's transfers to Kika does the same in terms of boundaries, um, you know, their purview, does that also so transfer? So Fresh Fields would, would still have theirs because they're tied to that, just that commercial district, so okay. they'll still have theirs. That's tied to that plan development. Um, for if Kika were to absorb the ARB, that just means they But who would be for Freshfields? Who would be reviewing that? Because currently right now, the same ARB, would they have to create a different ARB? Because just, it's Kika, I, well, that might that, be more technical. That's a technical thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, it could be a new member, but I think probably, just depending on the structure, it would probably be the same individuals in my, how I think about it today. Would you ever encourage the town to create its own DRB or ARB? I think, that would be my priority, I think, or my preference. I think most communities operate that way where you have an right. arm of design review board um, and it would just function just as you have your planning commission, your board of zoning appeals, and then your DRB, AR, uh, <coughs> ARB. And so it just falls naturally into <coughs> really the permitting process. It really falls naturally in the permitting process. When we think about a, a homeowner trying to get a permit, they have to go to Kika, they have to go to ARB, then they have to come to the town, then get signed off again from, it just <coughs> simplifies that process if it's really under one, one, uh, one roof. Are the communities- That's how I think the ARB area? should be. Are the communities outside the gate, like Riverview, are they subject to Kika's ARB? ARB? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to ARB.
Uh, just two more things. Uh, one thing is the marsh management plan. Uh, we've introduced this uh, to the Planning Commission already. Just the purpose I want to highlight is really to look at protection for the marsh side of the island through all of the flood mitigation, sea level rise uh, initiatives and resiliency things. We know that the most risk as far as our natural resources is the marsh side of the island. We want to have a healthy marsh, so the interface between the highlands and the critical area, how do we look and assess what do we need to do to, to ensure that our highlands are protected, ensure our homes are protected. Um, and so that's what the purpose of this plan will look at. Um, it'll look at the overall health, vulnerability of marsh, what areas that we could potentially uh, introduce um, different types of strategies, whether it be living shorelines or uh, bulkheads, that kind of thing we know we need to, to be studied. And so we'll have a consultant that will uh, help us out with that. That RFQ has already been released, and um, we'll be um, going through this sort of timeline to get someone on board to help us out with that project. Uh, both our planning commission and our biocommunal committee, they'll be heavily involved in that process. Um, and so that'll be hopefully kicked off by March, and we'll have a recommendation back to council sometime this year, hopefully. So what is the state of work for this consultant? Uh, I've had a series of questions. So really, it's a, a roadmap. But we think the simplest way to think, answer that question is the beach management plan gives us sort of recommendations of what to do, when to do it, when we have erosion events or uh, impact to our, our, our natural resource. We don't have that standard uh, same approach for the marsh side. The, the state actually mandates that beach communities have the beach management plan. It's not a state requirement that you have something that addresses the marsh. As time goes on, I think that will be a trend, and I think the state probably will move towards something of that nature, as we see a lot more development happen on the marsh side of the island, as we see um, a lot more erosion, uh, a lot more rising seas. Uh, and so we think that that will be a trend. But really, this particular plan will give the town more of a toolkit to say, okay, hypothetically, Ocean Park has more areas of critical need as far as the marsh compared to the preserve. Um, and so what do we need to do? We can do something customized for Ocean Park as opposed to customized for a preserve and say, maybe that's increased buffers. Maybe that's form of an ordinance, maybe it's in form of incentives. It's just giving us some tools, some opportunity to kind of figure out how to best protect that interface. And this will have to be vetted in accordance with the state because jurisdiction, of course, comes into play. Um, but it's just giving us some strategies to how to manage that interface. That's what the yeah. yeah. One of the things that we've seen really is individual properties will experience erosion on the marsh side and they'll say, mm -hmm. well, can I just put in a bulkhead? Yep. And now that impacts the, the properties adjacent to it. So what can we do when we look at that entire area? Is there something that will help that particular entire neighborhood um, to best solve that erosion issue? Will it ultimately, or could it ultimately evolve into permitting and easements and the like? It could. Um, that's a question that always comes from Ms. Capelli. Are we going to create an ordinance out of this, or are we just going to have recommendations? <laughs> um, but I, I think it's it's one of those things that the community input, the community feedback will help us determine that. I think the stakeholders um, with the state, the Conservancy, Kika, a lot of what um, uh, the initiatives do, uh, Lucas and what they're doing will help us at least get some idea of how that impacts. So I don't know the exact output, whether it's a a written code to say, hey, we will do this across island-wide, but it may be, I think, right now, my envision it'll be more neighborhood or community-based. John, with regards to this, I know, I believe there's one other community that has a marsh management plan, and that's the town of Folly Beach. Do they, is there just a policy guidance, or do they link it towards permitting? Um, or do you know? Jim, do you know that? You know, I don't... I don't know details, but I do know that they should create some ordinances and regulations out of the Maybe we can find out I, the, the, how they've tied their permit. The, the, what I share with the Planning Commission is that I don't expect 
don't expect for an ordinance to be created directly, but at least to give us a framework of recommendation, say, hey, maybe this type of ordinance would be good because I, don't, I didn't want to become where it's over-regulated or um, uh, too restrictive, that kind of thing, but really trying to find the best solution that will work for whatever area that's uh, needed, improvements that may be needed. And this could be adopted as part of our comprehensive plan because we have to create a resiliency section. So we could be able to utilize this to satisfy that new requirement through the state? Yeah, so moving on to the comp plan, I think um, just really quickly, I, I think everyone's familiar, but that was the vision, community vision. Um, our, our comprehensive plan is, is based on state law. Um, we mentioned the 1994 Planning Act that gave the jurisdiction uh, to establish zoning uh, to local communities, local municipalities. Although the comprehensive plan does not, uh, the comprehensive plan doesn't have uh, zoning technical requirements in it, but it gives us the basis for that zoning. So, so those questions earlier, we can tie it to the comprehensive plan and have so that basis in, in, in folded in. Um, Here's that highlight there, our, our elements, the state has now required a resilience element, so a lot of what we do with the comprehensive plan update uh, around resiliency, we have a lot of things already in place, so it's really more restructuring. Uh, in 2018, we did our update regarding natural resources, community facilities around sea level rise and flood mitigation, and so a lot of that work that was that was done in that update, we really just restructure and put it really towards the resiliency but as mentioned, um, uh, Kika has done a lot of work in this area, um, conservancy, a lot of studies, and there's some information that we will include for the marsh management plan that will go into the resilience element. Um, I think the final slide that oh, I have. Just to back up just a second, does environmental fall under the, the, the rubric of natural resources and resiliency element? Is that yes. how? So environmental falls under natural resources, correct? So that addresses wildlife. Um, it also addresses uh, the beach, maritime forests, et cetera. Yeah. John, with regards to, I know the comprehensive plan doesn't have the zoning powers in it, but it creates the basis for zoning. Um, as part of the natural resource piece, and I don't remember, I'm sorry, the comprehensive plan, I know we have um, blended in a lot of information related to preservation, conservation, and I know um, Kiowa Conservation has, has been pushing and asking to be somehow a part or incorporated into review processes, and I know that's not necessarily part of the comp plan, but but do we have, do we need to incorporate, do we already have things in there um, that incorporates our partnership and relationship with the conservancy? I know Jim's office, a lot of times when he talks about different things, he goes back to our comp plan and point out that based on natural resources, we state we're gonna do these certain things. Yeah, so the needs and goals um, and the strategies, they have embedded in their priority, um, sorry, the yeah statement of needs and goals and the implementation, implementation strategies has typically an agency that would be not necessarily responsible, but definitely would be critical in, the, in that particular area. So conservancy is listed in the natural resources element. Um, I, I mean, based on those conversations that we've had with them last year, I think it'll be good to include them um, again as we move forward. Uh, one of the things, as part of the comprehensive plan review process, our planning commission, they'll meet with most of the stakeholders that touch all of these different elements. So when it comes to natural resources or, or whatnot, we'll meet and include the conservancy as part of sort of a working meeting or work group. Um, when it comes to community facilities, we'll bring Berkeley Electric in, Kiwal Utility, just so they are aware of all of their infrastructure improvements and, and future goals. John, we're embedded, or is there any, is it embedded in any of this community engagement, community involvement? I mean, full-blown residents. I mean, do, where do they tie into any of the so discussion, you know, the, I'm not saying the writing of the document, but how does that fit in or does it? So 
if I understand, so I want to maybe take it in two directions. The it's embedded if they want input on the actual document itself, that goes through the the zoning um, ordinance, and that's uh, a standard amendment process. So it will have a public hearing attached to it, so the public will be involved. But if you're asking like directly, if I'm a resident, how do I input something towards transportation? Maybe I get you to rephrase your question. Yeah, I think, I, well, if I understand this question, so right now, our comprehensive plan, the only thing, there's nothing directly embedded into that once the document's completed. But on the front end, from a community planning participation, when you start to do the amendments to the comprehensive plan, you can have a number of meetings. We can even have focus groups. They can break it, the planning commission can decide to break it up in focus groups and then get the community involved. So at the front end of updating and um, revising the comp plan, you can definitely have as little or as much community input and process as you like in, in terms of amending and updating the comp plan. So um, we can do a variety of different steps to get the community involved before it eventually comes to council to adopt. It goes to the planning commission, essentially runs, they can run the meeting, they can have focus groups, they can have workshops, they can have a number of opportunities for public participation and in, in, in revamping and amending the document before it goes to council, because you all have to, um, you have to approve the final amendment to the comp so, plan. So, so is there in our, knowing that we're gonna do this this year, is there a plan to have any of that involved? That would be something that yeah, John so as the planner as, and the planning commission can put together yeah, that schedule. So I didn't, I didn't share the schedule as part of this presentation because it I'm gonna heavily involved the planning commission with it, but essentially the way that we typically break that down in the review process is two planning commissions will kind of bolster together with an element and we'll bring, we'll do a few elements a month and so hypothetically population housing land use will tie it together and we'll bring in all those stakeholders to tie it together we'll have a workshop and we'll bring that to the community before we bring bring it back to the full planning commission and before a full council so we'll have a series of it'll be a, an iterative process it'll, it'll be a really iterative pro process correct yeah. i just think this is a remarkably valuable document for everybody staff community interested parties to be uh familiar with and, and we clearly have an engaged community so the extent to which that can just be emphasized and, and I and it's not in lieu of the planning commission which obviously is made up of community or the that type of thing but I, I think it, you know it any does, way we can we ought to try to it does encourage it yeah I even share this with our our new planning commission members that that roll on um it's this the comprehensive plan really gives you an understanding of how the community oh, for the sure. lay of the land and so um, I think it'll be a good education too for all residents to be a part of this process. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, the comprehensive plan, if it's I, I agree, I think if it's done right and get a lot of community input, it almost becomes your beacon, your guiding light right. in terms of anything that you want to do, you essentially go to your comp plan, you've already got community um, involvement, they're vested in the comp plan, so you can say, well, based on the comp plan, we said we were going to do X, Y, and Z, and that's why we're doing X, Y, and Z, because of the comprehensive plan. So if you have a really good document, you can really utilize it um, and it's effectively. And it's the safety I net that I always fall back on when residents get upset and say, well, why are you doing this? I'm like, mm -hmm. well, we go back to the comprehensive plan. If, if I recall, when I went on the planning commission, the, the first book that Petra gave me was the comp plan. <laughs> Good. To read yeah. and ask questions. Yeah, no question. So, just. Well, and I think. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, but I think then in terms of the, not the rollout, but, you know, once, I'm not sure where we, at what point it's quote unquote approved by council, whatever, then the communication of this stuff just becomes critically important. You know, we have to see how new methods to just get, get this information. <laughs> As you say, John, here's the book and, you know, here's to read it, but I, there has to be. I, I think, I mean, I've had conversation with Stephanie, Stephanie B, and I think being a little bit more creative in how we, yeah. we've done the town notes, we've done right. different things, but just have to continually evolve in how we share and enlighten the community on yep. different Good stuff. Good stuff. 
So this was just a, a oh. brief, maybe I don't go too much deep into it, but maybe this was just sort of a highlight of some of the things, um, some of the bigger things that, that will actually change or be updated in the comprehensive plan review. So our, our, our town is growing. We, we've had some uh, new staff members come on and committee structures have changed. Our organizational structure will need to be updated. Um, uh, when we look at reviewing data, uh, our land use and development patterns. Uh, the, la the last time that this was done, Ocean Park was not nearly developed as where it is today. And so just making sure that Ocean Park fits into the future land use categories, et cetera. Um, based on the Key Island Parkway study that we're doing, I mean, the area of Freshfields and Bessie Carrison Parkway, is there any language that we want to include today in the comprehensive plan that speaks to sort of beyond the gates, if you will? There's been a lot of infrastructure improvements from Kika when you look at uh, the things that they're doing in um, the drainage, uh, Berkeley Electric and their infrastructure improvements, um, et cetera. In 2019, if you recall, we did the HRA housing study. That document right. will pretty much take care of our housing element. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of uh, good things that came out of that that we can use. And I mentioned the resiliency element already, just kind of how we would restructure. So. It's kind of really some of the bigger things that will come out um, out of uh, the comprehensive plan review. I don't remember, John, I think, no. And talking about the comprehensive plan review, do you have a schedule yet of when the planning commission plans on kicking that off? So March will be like our official kickoff, but uh, next month I'll, I'll have our preliminary meetings with the individual members of planning commission to get them acclimated to which groups they'll be working with um, but March I anticipate to, to have a kickoff. Thank you. It seems that I recall during the public presentations last fall there was um, there were issues there were pre there were not presenters there were people that spoke to this whole issue of dilution and um, just going back to that 500 acres, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I maybe it's not part of the plan review per se, but there's a certain definition to our community. Now, some may say that it begins and ends at the front gate. Some may say it begins and ends at the roundabout. You know, we're here, so we're obviously past the roundabout. You know, it becomes really dwindling down when you think past here. You know, and I, maybe someday, way out there, you know, annexation or whatever, maybe across it, I don't know. But that 500 acres continues to pop up, <laughs> you know, in terms of it's there. And um, I, I, I don't know, just to, it just seems like there there could be some not projection but insight into that whole thing. I mean, it it is what it is. You know, there's 500 acres. It could be 2,000 homes. That I, you know, and just follow the arithmetic. I don't know. I'm just yeah, talking. I, just not necessarily a response to you, but jokingly, I think when I started with the county and this building was was annexed. Uh, one of the jokes was, I mean, Kiowa would eventually be at River Road intersection. Yeah, <laughs> and we and we heard that too. <laughs> yeah. And so I mean, it's just, it's a it's a real question. Like, is yeah. there a hard stopping point? Is there a fluid process? But it, it's a you know. Thing. But I think as you looked at the Betsy Carrison, whatever your slide was, you know, the, which is true, and I think we have to work in concert with the property owners and the county relative to Betsy Carrison and its evolution. There's no question. However, again, that's going out this way, but that's there. You know, that, that part of it's there. So. Because clearly, maybe, maybe, maybe that was the first thing that came to mind when the, when the application was, you know, was, mm -hmm. we first received it, boom, and, you know, dilution. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it was the first thing in people's mind. It was the first people in some people's mind. And then it became, then it became much more a part of people's um, Concerns, you know, what, what's going to happen? 
is, is the town of Kiowa Island the, truly this enclave behind the first, you know, not enclave, whatever we want to call it, behind the first gate that happens to have a shopping center and their town halls down the road? I mean, it's just something to worth thinking about, discussing. Again, getting back to that, Stephanie, so that when something does come up, when the mm -hmm. question is posed, you know, just to say, oh, I don't know, you know, right. at, at least it was part of a discussion in 2022, mm -hmm. you know, and may not have anywhere near an answer, right. you know, there may not be remotely right. an answer, but it wasn't as though it was just ignored, you know, we, right. never, we never thought of that. Right, and then the comprehensive plan for the land use element portion, um, I think as part of the review, you can look, we can look at the unincorporated properties and we could say what we would think would be the ideal type of development that should go there. So if ever mm -hmm. consideration to annex it, the community has already have essentially have a, we and through this comprehensive plan update, we have the community buy-in, we're also looking at land that's not in the town, but essentially adjacent to the town. We've already said this would be ideal for mixed use commercial or residential, so it becomes part of our comprehensive plan. So if an annexation comes to us, we already have a plan that's telling us in the community, we annex this, this should be the zoning but, right. application. But you know, Ron kind of said jokingly that you can't really call Kasik a donut hole, but, it, but, but really Kasik in that 500 acres is kind is of it, our donut hole. It is Absolute, our donut hole, yeah, right. Absolute, so, Absolutely. So, you know, it is, I, I think the idea of saying, you know, should, should that be annexed, what would be our, mm -hmm. uh, maybe, Preference is not the right word, but our thoughts on that property. And I don't know that generally people fully understand, getting back to Mark's, Mark Pramar's presentation, that property is inside of the town. There's a development agreement that outlines uses, standards, that right. are, you know. The reason, is he is, the reason that he is here is because it's part of the town and there's a development agreement. All of this other land it's not part of the town, it's part of the county. There's no development agreement. The developer has no obligation at all to come tell us what their views, thoughts, right. agenda. They did, you know, briefly and, and, and in the and fall. And Kasik doesn't have any of those obligations either. I know, that's what I'm saying. It, 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 you know, but, uh, mm -hmm. it, but a desire, maybe not a desire, but at least a, a goal of what we would like it to be. Yeah. Yeah. To something. Right. Well done, John. It makes you think. Thank you. Are we taking a pause? Thank you, John. Thank, Thank you, John. John. Thank can you. we take a Yeah, we need a break. A, a break so, yeah. John, you have nothing on your plate. Use the restroom and do what you've got to do. What a job. Thank you, Scott. Take a time. Uh, two thirty. Yeah, I want to return at two thirty. Yeah. Oh, you send me a copy oh. of this so I can put it. And I have to use the restroom. <laughs> oh, those bones need to be moved around a little bit. Mine are. If this comprehensive mm -hmm. plan is an opportunity for you to strategize, oh, yes. what you're going to do with what they're doing. Now, if I were Kane, I would say that my strategy would be every day inside the roundabout should be so, the town rather where than do I go? Donut. That just creates problems. But uh, obviously, it is in the county, it is not your responsibility, and the owner of that property can, well, if you look at the egg, we're live. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. What is that? What have people done here?
Oh, good. Lynn? Jim, I talked to Aaron about our bird. The duck? Yeah, he told me the circumstances. It's unfortunate, but it is. It does explain why it was just sitting there. Yes, it does. We did, I guess, in Georgia, we sent the liver off to get tested. Yeah, that's what he said. So that would be good. How old a bird do you think it was? It was a young, young bird, so born Maybe probably two. spring, summer this year. Oh, really? The real young? Yeah. Yeah, who knows what happened to it. Well, you know, it's very likely it ran it flew into a car, you know. Flew into a car, flew into a tree. We all finished. Young teenage birds make mistakes. We don't know what they're doing all the time. Much like other teenagers. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, it's too bad, but, you know. What kind of bird was it? Red-tailed hawk. Juvenile red tail hawk was on my back porch, I was just sitting there. When, I mean, I could walk up. I know. And this, and we sat there, so they went wings all over here. I could run into something. We couldn't fly. I called it that. They couldn't fly. They couldn't, they couldn't fly. fly. No. I when I brought it back here, I let it go to see what. I didn't realize the twin was broken. I, what do they taste like when they're fried? It was only. Huh? I saw one sitting in a water, uh, a bird bath, 